Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food Podcast, presented by Canon Press and Great Homeschool Conventions. Stories or Soul Food. Fear the deer. Stories or Soul Food. Episode 35. 35. Yeah. Episode 30 plus five. Yeah. That also works. Yeah. Episode three times 12 minus one. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't, I think all we did last time with the number was the number of days in a month. So I'm glad we're reaching yeah. out. Yeah. We're really riffing on this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dragons today, but first a question from dragons, a, a, a listener who was upset that you said in episode four mm. that it, a young writer may not be ready to write a novel yet. Mm. And I think- uh, Dear questioner, stop it. Right. It, what's, do you want to flesh that out? They felt discouraged. Discouraged. Mm. And uh, my they question is- was as the, if they had been discouraged. Which I don't remember the episode that way and there's no way to check. <laughs> <laughs> Without having to go back and listen. Um, Okay. So flesh out your advice about how does a young writer know whether they're ready to write a novel? Okay. My question was going to be, is the novel any good? But have, yeah. Have about. they done everything else with excellence? Do they do fantastic character work? Can they capture scenes and prose? Snapshots? Can they do still life? Can they describe characters in motion? Like think about all the, are you, am I ready to animate a movie yet? Like, well, are you? I mean, that's, that's ultimately what it comes down to. So my goal is to keep young writers from being discouraged because overwhelmingly young writers write massive manuscripts and then are discouraged because nobody wants to read it. And they are trying to get their, their nice friends to read it. They're trying to force their parents to read it. Or acquisitions editors. Yeah. And people read it because they're being polite and they want to be encouraging because you're only 14 or you're 13. So I'm not going to say something rude. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to break you, and so you don't get actual feedback. You don't get honest feedback. You get parental affirmation. You get friendship. Uh, you get that kind of thing. So, I don't want young writers to be discouraged by having produced something really fat and not professional quality. How could it be professional quality? You're 13. You're 14. You're 15. If you like to cook, are you ready to be a chef in a Michelin restaurant? Are you, are you, if you're good at basketball, are you ready for the NBA finals? Like, where are you? There's a huge journey ahead to get to that professional level. And the best and easiest way, the most, the most efficient way to get there is to work on all those micro exercises before trying to do the big macro task. So all that drilling in the gym, all working on your fundamentals, your ball handling, everything else before you actually set out to conquer the big task. So I know plenty of young kids who can write novel length work. I know plenty of kids who can sit down and, and complete a manuscript. And that is impressive. It is impressive to be able to get through it. But then you look at how to get that manuscript from where it is to publishable. And it's frequently an unbridgeable gulf. Yeah, that's huge. Because just so, because you have sixty to ninety thousand words, right, or more, one hundred and forty, one hundred and sixty, one hundred and seventy thousand yeah. words has no I have three one hundred and eighty thousand words manuscripts. And my response to a kid with that is just like, I am sorry, because now you have so much more to say goodbye to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, so rather than being discouraging, you are attempting to stop them from being discouraged. Yeah, it is real. I know. I have just. I have talked to, and I know many young aspiring writers who have stopped writing completely because they finished a manuscript and they don't know how to get it from where it is to professional quality. And they they're so discouraged years. by that. Yeah, they wasted years of their lives on that or in individual cases, years of their life. <laughs> but they, uh, and so they don't want to do it again. Why would I just write another one when I don't know how to get the first one to professional quality? So I'm going to just duplicate the same mistake over again. Like work out, get in really good shape with your pros. Okay. And then here's a question. That's a, that's a great answer, but here's a question too. What do you think? Well, first, what are you like writing better? Dialogue, narration, action, description. Mm. Cause you can read a novel. 
I remember one, one of the one an early long time ago, a novel that I was reading where I realized this person just likes action. And so all they did was was yeah. just very short narrative sentences of people fighting battles. And very short narrative sentences do not a novel make. But I guess so what do you what do you like? What do you like to write? Would you lean towards one if it if... depends on what I just wrote on the previous page? <laughs> <laughs> but I would say I probably enjoy writing settings the most. Mm. So setting the stage, that's probably the most gratifying where I, when I've finished it, I think I've done something because now I can see something. I can see it. it. There it is. And now all the characters are set up. The, the stage lights are on. All the props are in place. Now something can happen. And mm, I, I feel fun. like after I've done that, I can go to bed knowing what I'm going to do tomorrow. Like, okay, I know, I know where this is going. When I write scenes where characters have uh, conversed or action has occurred, it never feels like I've done something. You know, it's, it's less satisfying to, oh, okay. to put the pencil down or to stop typing after writing a couple pages of that. It doesn't feel like you actually did anything. You just moved the puppets around. You Interesting. Just, you moved the characters around the stage, you know, on the stage, and you go back. And I, I'll, I will always start writing by editing what I did yesterday, going back through to you know get momentum up. And when setting is there, it's like, yeah, okay, I did a lot yesterday, and now I'm going to come. I moved characters around, and they did stuff, and now I'm going to you know review all of that and edit all of that. Is that because you feel like you created something? Yeah. As opposed with yeah. actors that are I've already painted in something. place. I've actually painted something. And then now stuff is going to happen. And when it goes well, when it's going well, I start over the next day. I read back over it. I edit that action or that dialogue. And it's immediately flowing by the time I, I run out of words. So as I'm reviewing you know, the previous couple pages from yesterday, and I hit the I hit the blank spot of the page. It just keeps going. They they remain in motion, and the song's going, and I can I can play the music. That's great. I enjoy that as well. But my very favorite stuff to write is what I call Crazy Berry, which is Crazy Berry, end. Crazy Berry, which I have I think I've referred to before on this podcast, which mm -hmm. is the title of the last chapter in Lee Pike Ridge, my first book. And so writing Crazy Berry is probably my favorite. The the setting, painting the setting after the dust is settled, the aftermath. So everything's done, the threads are all tied off, the story is complete, and you write that scene. That closing scene is really satisfying. Interesting. For, for a lot of reasons. Okay. That Mostly because be of all the suffering you went through to get there. <laughs> uh, don't most people kind of dislike the end? There's those f very few people who enjoy reading will jump to the end of a novel and read the end of it. They're monsters, I think. I hate human. them. I think they're in human monsters. I hate in human people form. to read the the <laughs> end first. But I do like writing the end. I don't write the end first, but writing the end is is just about my favorite because it's setting work. It's a painting with characters staged. You know, characters are where they are and they are who they are at that point on their journey. They and were, so they're yeah. even richer than the beginning. Yeah. And so you're painting this scene and you are putting the final taste in the reader's mouth, like the, the last touch, and then you walk away. And that is a very, very satisfying. Okay. Yeah. I think that explains why I have so much fun with the beginning of your novels as well. Like the Good. lizard, the lizards peeling yeah. and uh, <laughs> yes. outlaws and you yeah. know, settings are really fun. The town in Wisconsin, I still can't say. Economy walk. There's Economy a there's walk. a lot of people who go. think I just write action because there's a lot of action in my in my books, but I feel that I'm more of a setting painter than I am an action writer. There you go. Yeah, that's fun. Other random writing questions. Do you have a snack or writing fuel of choice? Oh, or does that also depend? That totally depends. It depends. Like on... Faulkner, are you a whiskey guy? <laughs> I, I do love whiskey, <laughs> but I do not drink whiskey while writing. I mean, there's lots of different forms of caffeine, but I, I need salt. So I have to find some salt vehicle and it doesn't really much matter what it is as long as it's salty. <laughs> so salt and caffeine. There you go. That'll get me there. I like it. Okay. Empire of Bones. Well, no, we're not. Empire of there. Dragons. Empire of Dragons. <laughs>
So Empire Bones, but we have another question first. Yeah, the question is more, what do we do with good dragons? Mm. Cause and then and then you we talked last episode about how you have a different kind of bad guy or two different kinds of bad guy. You have sort of in uh Drown Vault, we have Phoenix, which is the scientist gone bad, obviously. The and, one who, like all human villains, ultimately thinks of himself as a hero. Right. Yeah, and a messiah. And yeah. then you introduce and forefront is a very different kind of villain in yeah. Empire of Bones. Can you talk about Radu Bay? Radu Bay. Yes. So there are... How's he different? Compare and contrast. No, don't do that. That's a, <laughs> the worst kind of essay so, questions. We can do that. We can, we can do the worst kind of essay for this podcast. <laughs> so Dr. Phoenix is human who is trying to reshape the human race and trying to improve the world trying to quote unquote improve the world the way he sees fit. He's setting himself up as a god. He's he's kind of reaching for that that godhead status. What you have with Radu Bay is similar in that he is like a god. He's already got that demigod status courtesy of his extremely occult bond with a dragon. And so he's there. He is where where Phoenix would like to be, except for one major difference, which is the Roddy Bay is entirely anger, rage, you know, judgment. He's bringing wrath and justice from his own, bringing an apocalypse, a judgment from, from his worldview of justice. So his, his law, and he's going to judge all the world and all of mankind according to his law. And he is the demigod. He set himself up as that standard. But ultimately, it's out of, extreme personal affront you know he is uh entirely self-absorbed entirely self-interested and like a good dragon <laughs> um total narcissist and so somebody who's all who's only existing for themselves and for their own power and their own dominance he doesn't give a rip about like remaking mankind or or taking the planet into his version of an eschaton yeah, you know, like like Phoenix. Phoenix has this false gospel and you know a false vision and a false eschaton where Radu Bay is a false god and has a false law, which is displeasing him. Anything that displeases him. Okay. And he is here to judge all of mankind. Because they've starting, displeased him. Yeah. Starting with the order of Brendan. It's this spiteful hatred that I think is more demonic. It's just more like an absolute loathing and hatred for what God has done. Yeah, so in a sense, that classic distinction that evil can only corrupt, right? Yeah. It doesn't exist on its own. So you'd, right. you'd place each of those guys at different spots on the corrupting evil So there's spectrum, perhaps? There's false righteousness, and then there's false judgment, but there's false righteousness, and then there's really just, you think, you think about uh, what a false gospel does. Phoenix says, this way to salvation. You know, it's like, this is, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to redesign and save the human race. I'm going to bypass this whole death and resurrection thing. He's acknowledging the deeply flawed nature of man and setting up a new way, a new door into salvation. Now, he does happen to be the high priest and the one who's ultimately in charge. And so he's pursuing Godhead himself. But Radu Bey is a traditional destroyer. He is, I hate this and I'm going to smash this. This, gotcha. this displeases me. I'm going to ruin all of this. Mm -hmm. You know, all of this that was given, given to man is going to be smashed. Also, you think about the friction ultimately, the ultimate friction between God and the fallen angels is, can be boiled down into the phrase, man shall judge angels. Like that man is, is going to be, is going to be in the passing lane and is going to judge angels. And so what you have here is somebody who's extremely furious, extremely consumed with rage and hatred for mankind and is going to judge mankind. So man was made a little lower than the angels. Radu Bey uh, was born a mortal man, but has become possessed by and consumed by his union with Ooh. a dragon. And so he's, he's operating from that place. He's operating from that immortality. Uh, that comes 
from from being a fallen seraph. Mm. You know, so he's he's his soul's been basically swapped out. I mean, he's he's in that okay. place. So he is the incarnation of a fallen seraph, a false incarnation, judging man, hating man, hating everything here. Yeah. Total dragony self-absorption. Yeah. And bringing judgment. Okay. Again, comparing the two here. Well, actually this one, this one's a contrast. You seem to have affection for the uh, Phoenix's biological experiments. Oh yeah. His reborn. Yeah. The yeah. reborn. You, uh-huh. uh, there's an element of that that you don't seem to have for the trans mortals. Right. Is that correct? Yes. That you, you actually, well, cause you, I guess this is a spoiler, but that's fine. Dan. Yeah. Dan becomes a reborn. Yeah. Dan's right? been messed with. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a sense in which, how would, how do you think about Dan or how do you approach Dan as, as someone who's been, we would think of him as, oh, he's been completely polluted sort of because he's been experimented on and made what he's not. And, yeah. uh, you know, made something that's completely opposite his own nature. But there's no sense in your story that something's happened to Dan that's bigger than his purpose. Does that make sense? Yep. That could ruin him. Like he's yep. not ruined in a way where many people would feel. No, he still, he still is man. He's still made in the image of God. He's been tinkered with. Yeah. And that has had consequences and created weaknesses that uh, are the result of that tinkering. Phoenix does not have the authority to do the tinkering that he's doing, and yet that type of improvement is not cutting against the grain of God's reality. Mm. The way Phoenix is doing it and why he's doing it to what end he's doing it is all cutting against the grain of reality. It's all. But the fact that he has bigger evil. muscles and better the fact eyesight. That he has be- yeah, the fact that he has better vision and is faster and stronger and all those things, that's not contra the the grain of so you wouldn't be against dan having gotten lasik for example right (laughs) so it's just more the out of bounds means that the phoenix is using but i would be against somebody kidnapping somebody and giving them lasik (laughs) (laughs) so which is what happened so phoenix is phoenix is taking on this authority for himself the ability to redesign people i do not because i didn't want to push dan like past the point of no return i did not have him become photosynthetic or give him gills or my favorite the beetle digestion you yes. can eat wood you have one of those guys in silent bells which yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes you can just eat you can wood. just eat wood <laughs> you can just get calories wherever you need so ba- but basically i don't push dan to the point where it's been a mixing of strange flesh that's Radu Bay's thing. Phoenix is doing it to people he's doing that to other yeah so that's other evil. people he's re- he's that redesigning but Radu Bay is in that place where he is mixed with, with a demon, with a dragon. Yeah. So why don't you like the trans mortals? Why, why is there that missing affection? Is that that similar thing that, you, that, that Adam and Eve had a chance to be redeemed? The devil, not so much. All of this comes, this is where we, we roll the cards of how weird we can be. <laughs> Which is how weird I can be is that I can read the Bible like it's a story and not try to hide from what it's saying and then believe it. So Genesis 6. With that trigger warning. Yeah. <laughs> Genesis 6, we have uh, the spawning of the mighty men, the giants, who were, uh, if you read it, like a liberal, meaning you don't think you have to believe it. And my, my grandfather once told me, it's like, this if you is wanna, a great point. If yeah. you want to know what the Bible really says, ask a liberal, because they don't feel any obligation to believe it. So they'll, they'll just tell you exactly what Paul meant in Ephesians. They'll tell you exactly what Genesis 6 says, and then they'll say, and that's stupid. But if you want to see somebody really wriggle on the hook and try to find a way to have the Bible not say what it's saying, ask a conservative, because a conservative knows that they are stuck with whatever the they interpret. Whatever the answer is, I have to believe it. And so in the, in the case of Genesis 6, the, uh, the sons of God look on the daughters of men, they lust after them, they marry them. The offspring are mighty men, giants. Side note, jump around the different mythologies of world history and you, you encounter the same story also uh, in lots of other places. That is what resulted in the flood. That's what caused global destruction, was a complete hijacking of the image of God and a cheat code, a hack to try to get to the God man, to try to get to the incarnation. All these fallen angels are chasing the incarnation first. 
You don't buy alternate explanations for Son of God? There is no alternate explanation for Son of God. <laughs> That's really... all we're giving to those of you who are saying, but, 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 it's the sons of Seth. Yeah. It's the sons of Seth. And you're like, okay, so the sons of Seth married the daughters of Cain, and God got so mad that he killed everything. It's like, well, who were they supposed to marry? Right. I mean, like, and why was it all boys on one side and girls on the other side? And why were the kids giants? And also, why then are all, there are all these mythologies all around the world talking about the exact same thing happening? And that's what ziggurats were built for. Yeah, this is a trysting place, the, the top of these temples. And then you have, anyway, we could go on and on. Then you have Christ announcing his victory uh, when he's in the grave, descending and announcing his victory to the spirits that sinned in the time of Noah. You have Jude, which is weird. Why would the incarnate word descend and say, beat you? To specifically, specifically people at the time of Noah. Specifically yeah. beings who rebelled right before the flood. Wouldn't he, be, wouldn't he have said, beat you with the flood? Like, isn't that, like, <laughs> isn't that where the, the big beat you was? It's like, no, the beat you came from the God man, the actual incarnation. So anyway, jumping, 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 and we go to Jude. We see Jude talk about how the sin was the same, the mixing of strange flesh. The same sin that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. So there's, there's really, I have no, no reason. I cannot find a single reason to believe anything other than the sons of God lusted after the daughters of men, meaning, married them and had giants. Meaning mixing of angels Yeah, and the sons humans. of God and, and having these titans, having these demigods, the concept of these demigods. So anyway... Bear with me here. Even if you don't believe that. Yeah, grab hold. Grab hold and just say, okay, assume that's the case. Because now children, we're moving. <laughs> yeah. Ready? The children of those unions are not in the fall of Adam. Okay, because the fall goes through the, head, the heads of the families. Yeah, we are all fallen because our father Adam ate the fruit. And in that case, and we know that that corruption doesn't pass through the maternal line because Christ has a human because mother. Because Mary. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we, we can see that. You're like, okay, so in this world, the one we live in, the fantasy world in which we live, this particular fantasy series, which is phenomenal, by the way. And um, has been, that's been rubbing people the wrong way. I'll just let you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come here. I'm going to hold this cat by the tail and rub the fur <laughs> yeah. the other direction. We live in a fantasy world. It is a fantasy world. It is completely unrealistic. I mean, it just is. Well, that's the reason why people go with... Seth being the line of Seth. Yeah. It's because they have that idea of realism you've been talking about. Yeah, the faux realism, uh, which is the unrealistic version. So as Brian and I sit here chatting on the ball of lava going Mach 86 around the star, the burning ball of fire in the sky, which is busily making apples out of air, uh, which we will later put in our faces and get star power from um, <laughs> here in this fantasy world that, that we live in, we jump over and we see, okay, so. A fallen angel, cast down, decides to try to hijack reality, destroy mankind, steal A, the image of God, like vandalize and remake the image of God, and B, the incarnation. like Because they knew it was coming? We are going to be spirits made flesh, yeah. Mm. Well, also, there's, a promise to, there's a promise to Eve right. about the God-man. And so we, they're, they're jumping in. And so they're hijacking the whole thing. Their children are not fallen because of the garden they're fallen because of something that went down in the throne room of god their corruption their fall is from their father the devil mm. you know, like these are the children of the fallen angels and they are participating covenant covenantally and corrupted because of that fall which means there is no second adam for them okay right they're not, are, part, they're not part of that human They're not line. part of the redemption plan. And this is why through the Old Testament, you see flat out open season on giants. Mm. It's just, oh, well, there is one? Let's go kill it. Jonathan, you know, David, all these, all these stories are like, oh, the, we, we, have to, we have to deal with this. And so you see the giants, the ones who descend from this line are just in open war, constant war with the seed of Abraham. You know, the messianic so you think line. the Israelites were successful in getting rid of these guys? Yeah, but the messianic line is in a constant state of war 
with these lines. You know, it's just there, go hit it in the head of the rock. <laughs> like it's just take them out. And so you see that you pick up on that. You're like, okay, so there's the seed of the serpent. There's the seed of the woman, like literally the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman also figuratively. Gotcha. So the serpent has literal seed. The serpent has actual uh, children, actual children, false, false men, a false mankind and false saviors. And there's just hot war that runs all the way up to the actual incarnation, runs to the crucifixion, and then runs after the crucifixion into the grave where Jesus says, I win. And then he defeats death and comes back. I have remade mankind. Like I am remaking mankind hmm. in my image. This is the second Adam. The second Adam wins. So when I jump in with the trans mortals, why don't I have affection for them? It's like, well, because this, they represented my fantasy. They represent just the seed of the serpent. They are very bad people. <laughs> they are the, they, they have just death sentences on them. They all live. Uh, and in the new uh, side note, I actually modify a riff for new covenant theology such that there is burial and such that, you know, it's not just absolute extermination and oblivion. It's also burial. And they're all living on like a, a constant state of probation, mm. you know, so they can live judged by man. Sort of like Jesus with the pigs, the demons, where they say, yeah. hey, please don't destroy us. Yeah. Let us run into these pigs. Yep. Burial in the pigs. And so think about man was made a little lower than the angels, but he will judge the angels. The order of Brendan is a fulfillment, is one corner of a fulfillment of that prophecy. Man, in the image of God, descended from the second Adam, is sitting in judgment over angels. Radu Bey absolutely rages at that hierarchical dynamic change. The fact that he's in chains put on him by man, that he has been judged by man made in the image of God. Yeah, I was going to ask you, do we get to find out who put him there? <laughs> we'll see. Oh, okay. So <laughs> there's, there's just a few. Also threats. why mercy is there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the uh, mercy was just a sacrifice that was needed and she had to be walking by. So oh, okay. that's, that's the simplistic version gotcha. of Mercy Rios. So she gets pulled in. She has a backstory, but she's not like the chosen one or something. Okay. Um, she was necessary. Somebody had to die. So then we have angels, the, the seed of the serpent, raging at the fact that they've been judged by man. And then you, you, so you have that dynamic. And so I don't have any sympathy at all for them. Gotcha. Uh, for, a, for somebody who is uh, doing things that are not a total subversion of God's design for the world, but is doing is evil and, and needs judgment for the, the fruit of those experiments I can relate to. You know, I can be sympathetic to people who have been redesigned by Phoenix. Yeah. Because it's, you know, they're victims, but also they're not they're not rebels and they are still fallen men. You know, they're still of this, you know, of of mankind, of this race. Does that answer the question? The long thing? Yeah. So Empire of Bones, that like whole it. dynamic with Radu Bay is who sits in judgment over whom? Yeah. Yeah. Man over the angels or the seed of the serpent over the seed of the woman? Well, this is really interesting. How do we fit in someone like Nolan then? Because right? you do have some affection for that trans mortal. Is he yeah. a tran and similarly Arachne. Yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, Arachne because the backstory is Ovid. And there's a and particular. She was pretty mistreated. <laughs> yeah. And so Nolan and Arachne are both examples of. Uh, and then also, um, well, we, it, it, there's Wig, a few places. Yeah. With quick. Quick, we do too, where you have somebody who's submitting, yeah. who's laying down their rebellion and submitting to this judgment, submitting to the judgment of the God man and the God man's, you know, Christ and, and his followers. Yeah. Well, we and have more so, questions about quick, but I wouldn't quite yeah, get to so, them yet. So various trans mortals that you see existing in submission. Yeah. You know, they are submitting. And, and here we've moved to our fictional universe yeah. of Ashtown, although it seems consistent, uh, right? Yeah. And I think that living in submission is different than repenting and believing. But I also think in the New Covenant, unlike the Old Testament, where we have the, the initial hot war of the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent, I wanted to allow for the change of aeons in which the child of one believer is holy. And we, see, and we see that, you know, so 
I don't think the same thing would apply in the new covenant. I think, mm. you know, it's in the new covenant. Holiness is contagious. I think yeah, I've heard it. Exactly. Said. Holiness flows through the mother and the father. Corruption than flows it, through the father. Right. And in the old covenant, it would have been holiness wasn't contagious. It was the impurity. Yeah. That was contagious. So I think, I actually think that repentance and redemption is possible. Oh, wow. For those, for the child of one believer. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. Anyway, in the new covenant, not in the old. Right. Okay. Anyway, that's just me riffing though. I would never, right. I would never get all theological about that and try to, and try to like teach on it seriously. You know, like a, this is well, the yeah. way it works with giants in well, the New no, Testament. I, I think, but I think it makes sense. <laughs> right. I think it does. And it helps explain why I have that feeling of slight affection for these reborn beetle men who are trying to kill everyone that we like. <laughs> uh, I somehow still enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the goal. I mean, that's actually the goal. There's still, there's still people fighting, you know, and you can right. empathize. You can empathize yeah. with one of those people but you so can't this, really yeah. empathize with a with a dragon right and and that helps explain why in all the stories you keep this why there has to be the young woman and the dragon like the dragon yeah. wants to eat the virgin and yeah. and that's the way all it's of been. them and there will be some that represent the others but right you know the seed of the woman right and the uh the mothers are the enemy yeah and that's also why David, of course, had to crush Goliath's head, in your view, because yeah. he's seed of the serpent, so it had to be a rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was going to be the head, and it was going to be a rock. And also, also I, think, uh, I think it also, I don't think lusted after the daughters of men, I don't think in Genesis 6, I don't think that's, they were overpowered by their attraction to the daughters of men, which is what you see in like Greek mythology. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, there's always this, I'm so, but I'm so attracted. I think it's more... It is more devouring. It is more dragony hmm. in terms of like, I'm going to devour, but it's, I'm going to devour them because they are the vehicle for my destruction. They are the ultimate hmm. enemy. And then Christ being with the cross being stuck into the skull, Golgotha, the place of the skull. I think we get that final capstone. So that's all consistent. Nate's oh, yeah. view is consistent. It's here. all consistent. But the other thing is, none of this is necessary for kids to enjoy the story. Right. This is all just like pulling back the veils and the right. curtains and showing the wires and the reasoning behind right. why I structure one band of villains one way and one band of villains the other way. And thematically, the guidelines that enable me to make choices and decisions for how characters are going to behave and what their goals are. Right. And Radu Bay and the Transmortals are beasts. They're devouring beasts who view themselves as superior to mankind, mm -hmm. but are clearly inferior. You know, it's like, yeah. is there, it's a wolf pack. You know, it's a, it's a big pack of dragons. It's a pack of wolves. Whereas Phoenix says, hey, how about I be God and the Messiah? And let's try to conquer death this way mm -hmm. with, without repentance. And people do that all the time. And it's a, a flaw from within the human race. Okay. So that, okay. That makes sense. Can you talk a bit more about Quick? I assumed yeah. he was just a bit of a theophany. But then I see now you have, he's, he's same level as Nolan for you. But well, actually, a little bit of both. He he talks about his story specifically. You know that he came into. So he actually gives a, a little bit of a testimony in uh, Empire Bones, where he came into submission to the fool, where he mm. was a fool. So I would say he is a type, not a theophany, but a type of of a lamb, a type of the coming yeah. lamb, a type of the coming fool, capital F. Yeah, uh, the one who would. Uh, make fools of you know all all the stars right you know the cornerstone that was overlooked so he talks about his his kind of dominance of man and how he functioned uh then he present he presents himself as a type of the lamb gives them blood and is functioning in submission so he's he's one of those who's not radu bay where there's a man who is merged you know, who's unified with an occult power. This is, this is, um, a lesser spirit. You know, this is a spiritual being who behaved badly and then came into submission mm. and is now willingly submitting to imprisonment to the burial and yeah. could clearly exit at any time. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, there's nothing they could do. The only thing that's holding quick there is his own submission. Gotcha. Well, that answers Derek's question. Yeah, he, was, he didn't know why he was a lamb and where he came from. 
So, well, there, he, there he, you go. He becomes a lamb. He's a fawn functionally. Okay. And so he transitions like he, he, yeah. you know, switches over uh, and gives them a charm, a protective charm. Yeah. Against justice and wrath. Another picture of what we don't actually want of what Radu Bay is serving up. Mm. But what is fitting when applied to trans mortals, because there is no certain types of trans mortals, there's no, there's no uh, redemption for them. Gotcha. That's fun. Uh, dragon wise. Yeah. It seems like lately there have been a bunch of dragon stories where the dragons are actually good. You know, how to train your dragon being one of the sort of biggest ones. In your universe, obviously, these dragons are, are spiritual enemies and you can no more see one being good than you could in the classic old night stories. How do you feel about that change? What do you think about it? Is that a, is there, is that, what do you think about how to train your dragon? I love how to train your dragon. I like it a lot because I think it's a, those are biological dragons, not spiritual ones. Yeah. Just badly behaved. B (laughs) hiccup does what man should do. You know, it's like, this is, he takes dominion. He trains a dragon. Like it's all in the title. It's like, how do you train your dragon? So, which is incidentally a really hilarious title for that. If you think about that movie and that tone and everything else that it's called How to Train Your Dragon is is really, really funny. And it wouldn't be called that without the book franchise. But I like the movie a lot. I do. You just mean because it doesn't sound like a story enough? It doesn't match motif. So we have this Viking, you know, island village. And we're going to give this title to it. This, it would, it would be, it would never be called this. But neither would he be called Hiccup, and I like that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it it works. I really, I really like that movie. So it's super solid, and it's solid because of the way that he asserts human dominion over these over these creatures. So it's not a hey, we all just misunderstand each other. It's hey, how about you serve us hmm. and become our livestock? <laughs> <laughs> you know. And that's the way it should be, like bringing them into submission and into a fruitful role in the hierarchy instead of, yeah. Creation mandate. Yep. So I like it a lot. Then we, and dragons in general, I think, uh, should be treated that way. I have no problem. We shouldn't be exterminating saltwater crocodiles because they're dragons, which they are. You know, it's like, we, that's not the way we're supposed to be, you know, be functioning. If one tries to eat somebody, yeah, we should put a bullet in its head, but. But it should be free to, to be the creature God made. When we're talking about... And occasionally be ridden by Steve Irwin. Yes. <laughs> uh, when we're talking about spiritual dragons, actually, actually, Brian, <laughs> I love good dragons. Good dragons are great. Good meaning behaved, submissive obedient, dragons. Obedient, Obedient dragons. And I think there are more of them than there are bad dragons. Oh, yeah? But... They don't hinge in stories the same way because they're not evil. They're not, uh, they're, they're not that linchpin. They're not that dragon that needs to have its head crushed by the seed of the woman, you know, because. While bad. we're stepping on toes, can you explain how there are more of them? <laughs> <laughs> sure. One third of heaven rebelled and was thrown down. Oh, okay. My daughter, my youngest, was terrified and had like recurring nightmares, just dragon nightmares, horrible, horrible dragon nightmares. Also, waking nightmares. So she would wake up and she would still, she'd be wide eyed and awake, and I'd be talking to her and she'd be sitting in bed with me and she'd still just be like head on a swivel looking around, just seeing dragons everywhere coming through the walls and just terrified. Yikes. And so that was tricky to deal with. Um, until we found the root cause, cinnamon. <laughs> cinnamon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> At least that we cut off cinnamon and they all kind of stopped. But, but uh, Okay, yeah. Um, but uh, also, the other thing that helped at the same time as the cinnamon cut off was helping her process it and by telling her, for every bad dragon, because she's only seen bad dragons that wanted to get her, for every bad dragon, there are two good dragons. And that they obey God, the seraphim. The fallen seraphs are bad dragons faithful seraphs are good dragons they're still reptilian and wings and you know huge and and not biological these are giant you know spiritual powers that manifest if you were to really get a good look at one as described it's like okay this is what i'm talking about this is a dragon 
And so that's what Radu Bay is possessed by, is a fallen one. Um, but there's nothing perverse about the dragon form. Right, correct. You, you think it's... Uh, uh, the Archangel Michael is a good dragon. Okay. You know, so, you know, this is... If this is a seraph... Yeah, I guess seraphs, If he's a seraph, okay. We know what seraphs are from... Where are we? Well, yeah, tradition here, right? Is that oh, where we're going we, from? we have descriptions of the wings and... Yeah. You know, so yeah, cherubs, cherubim, seraphim. But a third of heaven rebelled. A third of heaven was thrown down. So down here on earth where they've been thrown, we're dealing with bad ones. We're dealing <laughs> with baddies. And the seed of the woman is supposed to triumph over the seed of the serpent. And so we're, we're hung up in that big brawl. In the throne room of God, we are not dealing with baddies. Yeah. That's, that's not where we're going to see bad dragons. You're going to see amazing, glorious, good ones. Okay. So, I like it. Yeah. There you go. So down here on Earth, it's they they possess a role that's overwhelmingly antagonistic because they've awesome. been thrown down. Yeah. Okay. Well, are you uh, good with that, Brian? I, I have we I melted am. your head a little too much? I, no, I think have we, we have. revealed. Have we revealed how much of a fantasy novelist I am? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we have. That answers a question from Jonathan from you know I think week two of our podcast. He was like, "I want you to talk about dragons." Dragons. <laughs> So the Dracul. Yeah. Uh, and incidentally, when, for those of you who are not subscribed to the silent bells periodical, when it eventually is edited and published in a single volume, you will be able to see further dragon exploration around the character of one Wiglaf. We'll save that for then though. Cause it's too exciting. Yeah. So Wiglaf spoil. has yet, yet another relationship to a dragon. Yeah. All right. Here's a question. I think Spencer, I don't know. He just wants to set the cat amongst the pig pigeons, but which of the ash town is the weakest he asks <laughs> <laughs> the weakest which which of the books is the weakest yeah the answer could be none of them none are weak it's <laughs> <laughs> they all tie they're all equally weak <laughs> <laughs> um that's hard to say because for me it is it is like saying which of the chapters is the weakest because it's one big story so it was always one big story and I mean, I would say the first one is never as strong because you can't pay off as much because it's, you're setting things up and you're getting started. So I don't know. I think I'd be inclined towards the first one. Um, Interesting. But that's not something I'd really stand behind. If I was going to, if I was going to analyze weakness, I would analyze, I'd have to get out the structural maps and look at the structure and look at the payoffs and look at whether or not things were peaking hitting crescendos that surpassed each other. Mm -hmm. My impulse would be to point at the first one just because it's the beginning and beginnings are weakest. And later on, you get to have the timpani involved and everybody's going in big crashes and crescendos. And the beginning is yeah. something you're easing into, even though it gets off to the races pretty quickly. So I don't know. That's what I would be inclined to say. I know other people have had opinions, but they have opinions based usually on their favorite characters. So... Mm. People who love Nolan and Nolan is their favorite, they tend to drift towards the more Nolan heavy books. Same thing with Arachne. Same thing with Niffy. Yeah. Brother Niffy. There's a lot of people who absolutely dogmatically insist that Empire of Bones is the strongest one. But I, you know, these are ultimately conversations that I, I tend to kind of smile at and nod. And, and I don't think it's terribly fruitful any more than comparing my different series yeah. to each other. It really doesn't really bear fruit for me. So I like to try to do something different and I like to try to set a goal that's harder. I like to increase level of difficulty. I could write, you know, little Lee Pike Ridge volumes all day. And then I would just be, you know, copying the same donut over and over and over again uh, and not actually growing and improving. Yeah. So I'm always trying to write something that will be hard for me to write that I cannot just guarantee success. Like I have to go, I have to go on a track. I have to go on a mission and try to accomplish it. Yeah. So Empire of Bones was definitely harder to write than Drowned Vault. Made even harder by my discovery that I was losing a volume in the series and was trying to, you know, weave stuff into, into Empire of Bones that had been held back. Trying to reserve everything that I'd planned for a book five, for a book four and moving a bunch of book four into book three. And yeah. So well, it was, it was Empire, really difficult. Yeah. Empire of Bones is, real is dark like it's a dark night 
It is dark. It's a dark night. And I think. Uh, because it is the end of act two. Right. So because this is one big story, if you just look at a story structure and say, what's the weakest act one, the first half of act two, the second half of act two or act three. In this case, Empire of Bones is the second half of Act Two. It's in that spot where the Dark Knight of the Soul happens, where all is right. lost. So, in traditional structure, you lose everything. Everything's destroyed at the end of Act Two. Yeah, uh, and any redemption, resurrection is going to come in uh, Act Three, but also at the end of Act Three, it's going to be a long, tough struggle. Right. So, for that reason, I don't think Empire of Bones is the weakest. Uh, but I don't know that the dragon's tooth is. I'm just inclined that direction. Fun. Fun to hear you talk about it. I think that idea of story structure with across your four books is really interesting and, and sets up a lot of things to understand why. Why is this one dark? Yeah. Why is Empire of Bones the way that it is? <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, the way or, that it is. Why is justice? Why, why is there justice and wrath? And why is there yeah. a mad Irish monk named Niffy? Right. Because there needed to be. There had to be. I couldn't not write a mad Irish monk named well, you. Well, you already had a, a serpent from Ireland, right? The Patrick. Yeah, the Patrick. So, yeah. so yeah. there's, and I've actually really enjoyed, this is a random thing, just kudos to random people out there. I've enjoyed requests that I've gotten from people for stuff they wanted to see in the Silent Bells that when things were already on the bulletin board. Oh, okay. And so, you know, people, there, there was somebody who requested that Arachne gather a spider army. Okay. You know, it's like, can we see? And it's like, oh, that's kind of funny. You yeah. Because there's, I wanted to see that. And it, it's not like, it's not the solution, but you can see that that's her last resort. And that's what she would, that's what she would have to throw at this. Well, kudos to those readers with their narrative. And there's some others on. that I can't say, because there's still some things coming that have been requested where I was like, yeah, that's really. <laughs> Uh, and we gave, we did give away something last week. I don't know if anybody responded to this, but about six Emperor Draconis where I had not fully paid that off yet in, mm. in the story. But anyway, if you were here, you heard first the sneaky flawed origins of that Latin motto. Yeah. Exciting. Well, it's fun that when you get the narrative wires out, I impressed my son quite a bit. When I was able to call a few shots in a novel he was reading, he was like, how did you know that, dad? <laughs> That's amazing. You're a prophet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How did you know that they weren't going to all die? How did you know that the real king, you know, that they were the descendants of the real king? You know, that kind of thing. And you know, it blows, blows you the eight-year-old's mind. there would mind. be a happy ending. And right. Say, yeah, I looked at the <laughs> author's name and it wasn't Russian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we have a bunch more we could talk about, but not today. Okay, is that it? We done today? That's it. We're out of time on Empire okay. of Dust. We'll, save, and... we'll save them up for next week. And, yeah. Because next week we can take a little hiatus in between. Yeah. Talking about specific titles. Right. Hit a bunch of questions. And I don't think we'll do one on, uh, unless you, well, do you want to do one on Silent Bells? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. I think we need to wait. No. Yeah. You almost wait. Yeah. So we can take a little between series breaks. Yeah. Hit a bunch of writing stuff. I'm also looking forward to getting some, uh, dragging some more friends onto this yep. podcast of ours. Yep. We'll do and that. So we have some standard, we have some invites that are out there that we need to, we need to book some people. It's not a habit of ours to have other people on, but there's a couple of people we have to. And uh, for those of you who think you've figured out stuff that no one has ever noticed before, Spencer wants to try this out. He said he was reading the Aeneid and came to a reference of a seer who writes on leaves and fire. Hmm. And Thought that sounded awfully like a character. Mm, in interesting. <laughs> and with that. Well done, Spencer. Plaudits to Spencer. <laughs> yes. He said Kudos. he almost jumped out of his chair. <laughs> <laughs> Virgil, that plagiarist. <laughs> Good stuff. Alrighty. Well done, Spencer. The end. The end. If you enjoyed this week's episode, get your signed copy of Empire of Bones today at canonpress.com.